So in this context, then, there arose a Roman Catholic priest in Germany, whose name, Germany and Northern Europe, whose name is Father Martin Luther. Have we heard of him before? So when we hear of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. here in the United States, Martin Luther King Jr., he, he was born Michael King. Michael King. When he started studying this part of the church history, what name did Michael take for himself? Martin Luther. So who is Martin Luther, this guy that he named himself after? First of all, let's just acknowledge that Martin Luther, there are lots of different perspectives on him because he lived from 1483 to 1546. Within the Roman Catholic world, we've, tre we've tended to demonize him, calling him a heretic and talking about how he was excommunicated, etc. Within the various Protestant churches of the world, he is a hero because he was a person who was not afraid to speak up against the abuses of the church. So a bit about his family. Luther was born to a poor German family. His father was a minor. So imagine for a moment, let's just imagine what his life was like. He was born into a poor family. When you're poor, do you have lots of things? No, there's, there's some austere times, sometimes when you're going to go hungry. Luther suffered austerity. He also had a very, he had some strict parents, which simply means that when you have parents who are strict and who are punishing you, did you learn your lesson today at school? Punishing in you? Punishing you? What's going to happen? That's going to be tough. When you start talking about God is, God is our Father, okay, wait a minute, I know how my Father is, and if I don't learn my lesson, my Father beats me. That was Martin Luther's experience. How is he going to imagine God to be then? God is one who, who punishes us. And so, Justo uh, Gonzalez also says that he was prey to various, Justo uh, Gonzalez says, to depression and to anxiety. I think today many psychologists would call it uh, manic depressive, right? I mean, he had his highs and his lows. I mean, there were times when he was really low and you just couldn't bring him out of it. And there were times when he was out there being a fiery person. So he lived a sort of bipolar experience, you might say. We didn't have psychologists back in that day, so it's hard to say. And all of those experiences shaped his view of God. So as a young man, everyone was talking about salvation or damnation. You were either going to be saved and go to heaven, or you were going to go to hell. And something like that was really affecting him. I mean, he just he couldn't. He, he thought about this all the time. Shoot, when I die, there are two options. I'm either going to heaven, or I'm going to hell. And so Luther was overwhelmed by this fear of death and this fear of going to hell, because once you go to hell, how long are you there? Forever. Forever, forever and then some. You want, do you really want to go to hell forever? Uh, Martin Luther's father was a minor, very poor, wanted his son to study law. Wouldn't that be nice, son? I live in poverty. I work like... Like, I don't want you to work I want you to get an education, which is the only reason why I beat you when you don't know your studies. His father wanted him to be a lawyer. Martin Luther, though, joined the Augustinian order at age 22, partly because he was caught in the middle of a thunderstorm one night, and he told St. Anne, he said, St. Anne, please save me. I don't want to die tonight. And if you save me, I will join the religious life. What happened after that? Storm passed. Oh, rats! <laughs> they joined religious life. Joined the Augustinians. We talked about them in our course on spiritual theology. They followed, uh, followed St. Augustine. He was ordained a priest. But this becomes a problem. Did you ever notice that Mass, Father Jamie, takes and holds up the body of Christ? Now, Father Martin is ordained a priest, and he's saying to himself, Oh, wait a minute. I am not worthy. I am not worthy to hold the body of, of Christ in my hands. I can't do this. I can't do this. And that's just the beginning. He felt himself unworthy. He thought to himself that neither good works nor confession, the celebration of reconciliation, could justify him before God. Even if I go to Mass ten times a day for the rest of my life, how can that make up for my sins? If I go to confession, I'll confess most of my sins, but then I come out and I remember a sin that I didn't confess. Can you imagine living in his skin? 
So he went to a spiritual director. You know, as many of us as priests, we have a spiritual director, a person that we go to be able to share what's happening in our hearts and in our lives. He went to a spiritual director and shared all this and said, you know, I think I'm going to hell. I can't even hold the body of Christ that I'm a priest, that I go to confession and I think of the sins that I committed. He's sharing all this with a spiritual director, and his spiritual director says, why don't you read the mystics? Remember, uh, Justo Gonzalez had a chapter on the mystics. How is the, the mystics focused on God's love. It's not about God who's going to beat you and punish you. It's about God who loves you. With the love of a father. Ooh. So Martin Luther now has this challenge. because how do you love a God? Okay, so I'm just supposed to love God. That's what you're telling me? I'm supposed to love God? A God who condemns people to hell? He said, I hate that idea. I hate the idea that I could go to hell one day. And I cannot love a God who could send me to hell. It's like loving my abusive father who's punished me my entire childhood. That's hard to forgive. How do you love an abusive, punishing God who can send you to hell? And so Luther ended up concluding that he did not love God. He hated God. Here he is, a Catholic priest, serving the church and saying to himself, I hate God. In an age before atheists, right, before people said, I don't believe in God, his response was, I believe in God, but I hate God. I hate God and this whole idea of who God is, damning people now. So what do we do with a priest who's having a, a crisis like that, right? If a, if a priest comes, Father Leobardo comes to us and says, I want to be a priest, but I am really having some difficulties in life. <laughs> what do we do with him? Do we name him pastor? <laughs> so what did they do? They sent Father Martin off to teach scripture at the university. So, so here he is at the University of Wittenberg, where he's teaching scripture, and suddenly his eyes were opened because he's teaching the book of Romans. And listen to the, to the words of, the cha of Romans, chapter 1, verse 17. What does St. Paul say in the book of Romans? In the gospel, the righteousness of God is is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from, the first, from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by what? Faith. And from that time on, we have this dichotomy between faith and works. Are you justified? Are you saved? Are you saved by your works? By how many times you go to Mass, and by how many rosaries you pray, and by how many times you fast on the Fridays of Lent, are you earning your own salvation, or does your salvation come through faith? Does it come from God? Are you earning it, or is it something that God gives you? And what did he conclude? He concluded the good news is it's not something I have to earn. It's something that God is going to give me or not. Something that God's going to give me or not. So he interpreted that this justice or righteousness, when, he, when we talk about the righteous, what makes them righteous? It's something that comes from God. We call it grace. So if you're justified by faith, that's because of grace, because of God. And so he came up with this doctrine of justification by faith. It's God's grace that's going to send you to heaven or send you to hell. So faith and justification are free gifts from God to sinners like us, and Luther was well aware of his sins. And so you don't have to hate this justice of God, of this God who can send you to hell, because God gives the grace for you to be saved if you're going to be saved. If you're going to be saved, that grace comes from God. It's nothing you can earn. You don't have to go to Mass to earn it. You don't have to stay on your knees all night long praying. If you're going to be saved, it's going to come from God. So Luther, because he's teaching scripture and he's reading those lines and he can't believe what he's reading, he starts talking about this to all the other professors at Wittenberg and they start scratching their heads and saying, you know, I think you're on to something. It's probably not about me praying the rosary three times a day to earn my salvation. If I'm going to be saved, it's going to come from God. And so Luther wrote 97 theses, 97 points that he wanted to debate at the university. And he wrote them out, and they really didn't go anywhere. So he decided to write another 95. You know, let's talk about some of these things. 
What were the second 95 about? They were about indulgences. Remember what indulgences are? Buying time out of purgatory? Let's talk about purgatory here at the university. Who? Those were popular. Why? He wrote them in Latin so that they'd be discussed at the university. They translated them to German. We had the printing press. What does that mean? You know what? I just translated his theses into German. Let's, let's make copies of them tonight in the printing press. And we're going to get them all out all around the town. And suddenly everyone is reading about what he said about indulgences in German, in their own language. Was he saying good things? Oh, we don't even have to go there, do we? So we remember that indulgences, you know what happens with indulgences? Indulgences is a way of making money, right? Is the priest who makes that money going to keep the money to himself? If Father Jamie starts selling indulgences, is he going to keep it all to himself? I have a feeling there are other people who are going to want to cut of the profits, right? Archbishop Johnson, he sent me an email last night. <clears throat> Dear Father Jamie, beginning on August the 4th, 2015, you are authorized to sell indulgences at Holy Family. Please remit 50% of the earnings oh. to my office. Imagine that for a moment. A lot of people profited off the sale of indulgences. Martin Luther just wants to ask some questions now about these indulgences. I'm a priest. I could sell indulgences. Should I be selling indulgences like my brother priests? Father Cleophas. You should see the money he's raking in from selling time out of purgatory. So, he was attacking... The, this this uh, source of income who was authorized by Pope Leo X, who was still alive, who he perceived, and Justo Gonzalez says that Leo X was a corrupt, greedy, lazy Pope. Ooh, those are not exactly the most desirable qualities to look for in a Pope. He was a corrupt, greedy, lazy Pope. Authorized the sale of time out of purgatory. Leo X, a bit of background on him. Okay, you want to be the Archbishop of Mainz in France? I'll sell that to you for 10,000 ducats. Sold it. Sold to the highest bidder. Um, so he sold that to Albert of Brandenburg, who already had two, that should say, two bishoprics. So he's already the bishop of two different places. Now he bought, being the Archbishop of, of Mainz as well, and the Pope, Leo X, allowed Albert to announce the sale of, of, of indulgences in his territory because it cost him 10,000 ducats. You want me to pay 10,000 ducats? Your Holiness, with all due respect, that is crazy. Yes, I want to be Archbishop, but it's not worth 10,000. That's crazy. What did, what did Pope say? I've got a plan. What if you are Archbishop? You sell time out of purgatory, and we split the profits. You can use it to pay for your buying of the archbishopric, and I can use it for my own purposes. And so, what happened in that, in that the beginning in 1514, let's follow the timeline now. In 1514 now, I, in my area, in mines, can sell indulgences. I'm splitting the profits 50-50 with the Pope, and we're both making good money. Uh, the good thing for the Pope is that, I mean, the Pope didn't have a lot of money at this point. Why? Because of the great schism, right? We had this division between France and Italy. We had the warring inclinations of Renaissance, Renaissance Popes, these Popes who were always going off to war. Remember the Crusades? Okay, they were financing more like the U.S. going into Iraq, paying, what were we paying back at that time? Like a billion dollars a day? The popes were financing wars and were left without money. Ooh, the selling of indulgences sounds like a good idea. <laughs> also, Pope Leo X, his predecessor, Julius II, the warrior pope, or the fearsome pope, in 1506, he began building what he hoped would be the biggest church in the world. Do you remember that? His dream, Julius II, a Franciscan, had this dream. As Pope, I will have the biggest church in the world. Leo comes along. 
they started building the biggest church in the world, but we have no money to build the biggest church in the world. How are we going to raise money for the biggest church in the world? Albert, Archbishop Albert, come to my office, right? What if you sell indulgences in your territory? Let's do a pilot. You sell indulgences, send half to us so that we can build our church with the money from indulgences. Good idea? Note the irony then, the biggest church in the world, St. Peter's Basilica, was built using what money? Money from indulgences. And it's that issue that would split the church. Had it not been for the desire of those popes to build the biggest church in the world, I want to build the biggest church here in my backyard. What's it going to take? Well, let's, let's do this scheme, Father Cleophas. You sell indulgences, send 50% my way, I'll build my church, you get whatever you want. The deal was struck, and that ultimately would lead to the division of the church. That was in 1514. In 1517, Halloween night of 1517, the legend says that Martin Luther took and nailed those 95 statements, we call them the 95 theses, to the, to the castle church door in Wittenberg, according to the legend. With modern scholars probably don't think it was that dramatic. They probably just think that he published them, and people started to spread word of them, and he became famous pretty quickly. Because he was attacking the system that supported the church. In Germany, the sale of indulgences was directed by a Dominican. Okay, a Dominican. Who do Dominicans follow? We just celebrated on August, on August the 11th, this coming Saturday. We celebrate St. Dominic, right? St. Dominic is the founder of the Dominicans. Was Martin Luther a Dominican priest? Yes. No. no. What was he? He was a Augustinian, Augustinian priest. Wait a minute. Okay. So suddenly, Martin Luther's fight as an Augustinian against indulgences became this fight between the Dominicans and the Augustinians. The Dominican was overseeing the selling of them. So yes, they're good. We're for the selling of indulgences. The Augustinians were against the selling of indulgences, so it wasn't just Martin Luther versus the Pope. Wait a minute. The Augustinians came to his side and said, you know what, maybe he's on to something. Maybe he's on to something. But this uh, German, Dominican, uh, Father Tetzel, so Father John now, Father John Tetzel is coming along and saying, I'll sell you some indulgences, and he had, he had people preaching this, right? He had them saying things like, when you buy your indulgence time out of purgatory, you're going to be cleaner than when you came out of baptism. <laughs> Come and get your indulgences. You'll be cleaner than when you were baptized. Cleaner than when you were baptized? Does anyone here have a problem with that? He said, Come and get your indulgence. You'll be cleaner than Adam before the fall. Cleaner than Adam before the first sin? You can't be cleaner than Adam before the first sin. There was no sin. And he also said, you know what? Those dead people you want to get out of purgatory, you don't just have to buy your own indulgence. You can buy an indulgence for your dead father or your dead mother. Whatever, whatever person has gone before us, you can buy them an indulgence. And as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, ding -a -ling, the soul from purgatory springs choo, up to heaven. <laughs> As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, ding, 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 the soul flashes out from purgatory to heaven. Do you have a problem with that? Shoot, let me see how much money I have on me today. I want to spring a few souls here. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly, who's in charge now? Does God determine who's going to heaven or hell or purgatory? Or suddenly are the rich determining who's going to heaven? And I'm, gonna, I'm feeling generous. I'm going to buy a few people out of purgatory today. Dominican, Father John Tetzel was saying that. Augustinian, Father Martin Luther, saying, oh, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. The nationalist sentiment started pitting Germany against Rome and the Augustinians against the Dominicans. Luther sent his own copy to Albert of Brandenburg. Remember who he was? the one who bought being archbishop, right? And was selling the indulgences. Send a copy to him. Copies were translated and circulated due to the printing press. 
Luther address the efficacy of indulgences? Do, do indulgences really work? And he also addressed the exploitation of indulgences. If a person, if a poor person only has one dollar, is it better for that person to spend that one dollar on food or on an indulgence? He said in thesis number 82, if the Pope can free souls from purgatory, then he should do it freely and out of love and not for such trivial things as building a church. If you're the Pope and you can free people from purgatory, then do it! Don't be using it as a fundraiser. If you're the Pope, let him go. Yeah. Let the people out of purgatory. You can do that. Thesis number 51. The Pope should give money raised through indulgences to the poor. Okay, you're the Pope, you've been selling indulgences. You know what? One of the 95 things he said was that the Pope should give all that money to the poor. And if that means that you have to sell St. Peter's Basilica, sell it. The Pope has a problem with this German Augustinian friar, Father Martin, who's talking against the system. So the Pope says, why should I have to deal with this? I have enough problems to deal with. Let's let the Augustinians deal with it. Is that a good idea? Tells the Augustinian order, you deal with your friar. Martin Luther goes to his Augustinian friends and says, do you all think I'm onto something here? Do you think it's right for the Pope to be profiting like this, building the largest church in the world by, by deceiving people? By telling them they have time out of purgatory for the piece of paper that they buy? The Augustinians sided with Martin Luther to a large extent. They were going to stand up for him. Uh, fortunately, many favored his teachings, and it became this fight between the Augustinians and the Dominicans, us versus them. The Pope then sent Cardinal Cajetan to Luther, demanding that he recant, that he take back everything that he said. And Luther said, I'll recant, I'll say that I'm wrong, I'll take it back, if you show me how I'm wrong. That was pretty bold to say that to a Cardinal. I will, I will apologize if you, Cardinal, show me how I'm wrong. Luther knew that the Cardinal had the power to arrest him, and so... He escaped at night. He appealed to Frederick the Wise, who was the elector of Saxony, who founded the university that he was teaching at. Right? He went to Frederick. And what the interesting dynamic was that Emperor Maximilian died. The Pope didn't want the King of Spain being the next emperor, because then he'd be too powerful. <coughs> didn't want the King of France being the next emperor. So what about the elector of Saxony? What about Frederick? Ooh, I want Frederick to be the next emperor. But if I want Frederick to be the next emperor, he founded the University of Witten, Wittenberg, and it's his friar who's creating all of this, so we'll just let Martin go. We won't say anything about Martin right now. So Leo postponed, po the Pope postponed the, the condemnation of Luther. Luther agreed to abstain from controversy. He said, okay, I'm not going to argue or talk about these things so long as your other people don't either. What happened? The other people started talking, and they started attacking. They said, okay, they have an agreement where Luther's not going to talk, so long as others don't. So we're not going to attack Luther, because he's not going to talk to us. He's not going to talk on indulgences. Instead, we'll attack one of his friends at the university, another professor. They attacked the other university professor, started accusing him of heresy. And what happens then? Martin Luther comes and defends him. So a long story made short then, Long story made a little less long. Luther was declared a heretic. Why? Because when they had to debate then at the university, they declared, Luther declared himself in agreement with John Huss. Remember the guy from Bohemia, the Czech Republic? He, declared, he said that, that the council was not right. The council was wrong in condemning him. Ooh, so you're siding with a heretic? And also, he said that a Christian with the support of Scripture, a Christian with the Bible, has more authority than the Pope. Dulce, with her Bible, has more authority than the Pope. A Christian with the support of the Bible, you know, if you read the Bible and you prove that you're right, then you have more justification than the Pope. That was a dangerous position for Father Martin. A few weeks after the debate, uh, so 
So Luther was declared a heretic as a result of, of that debate. People started taking sides, and people, Luther was supported not only by Augustinians, but also by Germans. Germany was supporting him. Humanists, these people who said that you need to go back and read the original sources of the Bible, they were supporting Luther. So now we had this divide going in again. A few weeks before the debate, Charles I was elected emperor. We remember that the Pope wanted Frederick of Germany to be the emperor. Well, you know what? Now that we have a new emperor, we don't have to worry about trying to be nice with Frederick or with Father Martin, that heretic. And so what happened was the, the Pope, Leo X, he condemned Luther. He said that all of Luther's books should be burned. And he said, Luther, you have 60 days to report to Rome, or you are excommunicated. So that was fun, because that set off all sorts of book burning. Some people burning Luther's books, and the people who said that Luther is right, the Germans and the humanists, burning the Pope's books. <laughs> right? And in the end then, Martin Luther, when he received that notification from the Pope, what did he do with it? Publicly burned it, along with other works by the Pope, and so he and the Pope were not friends to say the least. Luther publicly burned the papal bull, that communication, together with other popish bull documents. Bull document or what? The bull is a document written by a Pope. The papal bull, B-U-L-L, -L, the papal bull, he burned that document, that communication from the Pope. He was called to recant before the imperial diet, the, the diet with a capital D, it's not what the king means, the imperial diet is the group of noblemen, and clergy to lead the religious, the religious and civil authorities of that place. So the German authorities, Martin Luther appeared them before them in 1521, following the timeline now. Four years later, he's now appearing before them, and he's, they're holding him accountable for what he said. He said, My conscience is a prisoner of God's word, the Bible. If the Bible says it, I have to do it. If it's in the Bible, we follow it. He says, I cannot and will not recant, for to disobey one's conscience is neither just nor safe. God help me. Amen. So now, not only has he angered the Pope, he's angering the civil authorities too by refusing to recant. 